I want you to think back and remember when. No, Bob, go back further than that. Way back. Way back to your very first crush. You remember her name? Do you remember how handsome he was? Got that picture in your mind now? What was that one thing you wanted to do more than anything else? No, not that. (laughs) You wanted to spend time with them, didn't you? You wanted to be in her presence. You wanted to talk to him and to gaze into his eyes, didn't you? You wanted to be together. And you know, when you couldn't be together, what were you doing? You were talking on that cool rotary phone. I still had one when I was a kid. And, and you would talk for hours, and you never lacked for anything to say, did you? And about an hour in, your dad is going, would you get off the phone? Someone might be trying to call. You ever do that to your kids? Yeah, of course you did. We wanted to be connected and We wanted to know everything there was to know about that person that we had that crush on. When you get to Psalm 42, it might seem almost like one of those wonderful high school crushes, I think. Listen to the words. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. It's a little gushy, isn't it? Almost. I imagine in my mind's eye when I hear this, my deer, uh, the deer pants, I, I imagine an Arizona mule deer up on the, the high plateaus of Arizona in the summer heat, and there's no water, and they're camped out in the shade of the trees uh, waiting for the summer thunderstorms to begin. And once they do, that rain comes and it fills up the water pockets and the, and the hollows and the malpai rock and the deer drink their full fill and they are, you'll find the deer running and chasing and having fun. They are they're come to life once more. That wonderful moment, like the deer seeking fresh water. The psalm writer asks the question, When can I go and see my God? When can I go and meet with God? Now, this is not a rhetorical question that the psalm writer is asking. It's a serious question. A serious question from his heart asking, asking. Consider for the Israelites out in captivity, the temple had been destroyed. The people ripped away from the land that God had promised to them. Outside the presence of the temple, they didn't believe that God's presence was real with them. So naturally, they longed for God's presence. You know, I deeply admire and respect those of you who have experienced long periods of separation from your loved ones, maybe because of uh, military service or Uh, other circumstances where you've been separated for a long time and the only way you could communicate was via letters and sometimes not very often with those. I admire that. Valerie and I were uh, spent weeks away at a time when I was in seminary out in California and that was tough for us let me tell you. We, We thank God for cell phones, amen? Well, at least once in a while, when they aren't going off when you don't want to talk on them. But because of cell phones, we were able to stay in touch. So she'd get home from from school, and I'd be on the phone talking to her, and we would continue our relationship. And she would often ask me, so when are you coming home again? Reminds me of the the psalm writer, when am I going to meet you again? Do you long for God and to be in his presence? This isn't just a Sunday morning question. This is an everyday question. How 
frequently does the thought of God come to your mind? How often do you engage in short conversations with God, thanksgivings, intercessions, or praise because of what he's done for you? For the psalm writer, it may have taken the duress and slavery of the loss of the temple before the reality of God's daily presence became so important. I want you to imagine for just a moment, difficult as it may be, that you are no longer permitted to come and practice your faith, to come and worship together as a body. In fact, maybe imagine if you can, Lakeview destroyed by fire along with every other church in Sun City and across the valley. Even the mention of God or Jesus could bring you trouble. The persecuted church today can probably relate much easier and better than we can ever hope to understand. One estimate places over 215 million people, million Christians, under active persecution in the world today. North Korea is at the top of one list I saw. And no, the United States is not anywhere near any of those lists. We enjoy an unprecedented freedom to practice our faith. Unlike the psalmist, these Christians, even under persecution, are in God's presence. They don't have to go to a temple to worship. They don't have to gather much as they might desire with their fellow believers to worship God. They can talk to God anytime. They can give him praise, even from a prison cell. You know, we're soft and comfortable. Yeah. We tend to move God to the back burner because we don't often need God. And when we do, he's conveniently right there. We can just bring him out. If we're to be Christian, we must be active in our faith. It's counterintuitive to think that you can be a passive Christian. This is not dependent upon age or health either. Let me say that. There was a longtime uh, history professor at NAU, Dr. Garland Downham. Uh, I, I had known Garland since the early 70s, and uh, he uh, was a, beyond a, a history professor. Uh, he was a member of Federated Community Church, a consolidation of United Methodist Presbyterian and Community Church. And there at Federated, he, uh, he even wrote a history of the church there. Uh, in his later years in life, Garland uh, developed dementia, and uh, early in my uh, pastoral aspirations, I had occasion to uh, preside and to uh, conduct a worship at his uh, retirement center, and his son Charles was there with him. Now, Garland by this time was not speaking, and uh, we began to sing. And so we sang good old number 77. Oh, Lord, my God. And Garland began to sing. And we said the Lord's Prayer. Garland began to pray and recite the Lord's Prayer. Garland never quit following Christ. And he hung on to his passion for God even to the end. I titled this message, I Heart Prayer. You know, it's, it's uh, Valentine's week, our sweetheart week. But I love prayer because like my relationship with my loved ones, I've cultiva cultivated my relationship to God. And prayer is the means to that love with God. Oh, God already loves you, but we have to learn to love him. God already loved me just as he's already loved you before you were born. He knit you together fearfully and wonderfully in your mother's womb, amen? Your life of prayer, your life of prayer, not merely second thought prayer, is what enables you to fully, uh, fully em embrace and experience God's love in your life to fully experience the Holy Spirit 
and to have the strength to follow Christ on this uh, grand journey that we are on. R.T. Kendall, a former pastor at Westminster Church, wrote a great little book called, Did You Think to Pray? Isn't that a great question? Did you think to pray? How often do you come away from something and say, ah, why didn't I think to pray about that? Well, he calls prayer a fringe benefit to being a Christian because it's not uh, an essential for us to receive God's grace and salvation as we enter into our relationship with him. And yet, uh, even though he calls it a privilege, and indeed it is, it's not limited to Christians because God's waiting to hear from everyone. God's waiting to hear. And if we don't call out to him, he won't hear us. Now, if it's a fringe benefit, I want to ask you, why on earth would you not want to receive this fringe benefit? What subject of any kingdom ever, anywhere, any time did not want to have the ear of the king? Jeremiah 33, 3, God teaches us this. Call to me and I will answer. I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. If prayer's a fringe benefit, it's still an essential to a life of discipleship. You cannot fully benefit from the Christian life without a life of prayer. You cannot reach your potential or serve effectively if your prayer life is sick or weak. We use the term life of prayer because it is. It takes a lifetime of prayer, continuous, frequent, and intimate to know God. In verse 5 of Psalm 42, the writer acknowledges this humanity that we all share our struggle. He writes, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Why am I so anxious? Why do I worry? Why am I so caught up in this struggle? And he repeats this lament in verse 6 and 11 like a chorus. But he doesn't end with the lament. The next phrase of the chorus is the perseverance of faith and an invitation. He writes, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Put your trust in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. See, when prayer becomes a part of you that it is a reflex to respond in prayer and instinctively turn to prayer in every situation, good and bad, when prayer is your first response, then intimacy with God is natural for you. When prayer is your first response, then you pray in God's will because you already understand his will. You act in mercy and compassion because it's your natural response to what Christ has done for you. Prayer ceases to be a crisis response. Now, there's nothing wrong with prayer and a crisis response. We need that too, right? But God's inviting us to be more in conversation than that. Why do I love prayer? I love prayer because I love God, and I, I want to love him more and deeper. R.T. Kendall challenges people to begin their life of prayer with 30 minutes every day. Now, if you're not already praying, 30 minutes might seem overwhelming to you. I want to, you know, but consider this. One study revealed that the average believer, uh, including pastors, spend less than three minutes a day. Three minutes a day out of 1,440 minutes. We can do better. We can do better. I think your clergy staff here spends a little more than three minutes a day in prayer. I want to invite you right now, uh, wherever you are in your prayer life, to begin working toward uh, a challenge to pray 15 minutes every day between now and Easter. I think we can do that. 
I think we can do that. Now, if you're already praying 15 minutes or longer, I'm going to challenge you to double that between now and Easter. Here are some ways you can begin expanding that time really easily by try some of these. One, pray a psalm every day. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, even while in prison in Germany, prayed a psalm or more every day. He prayed in it. He lived within those psalms every day. Pray your favorite hymn. Pray the prayers in the Upper Room Devotional online or the paper version. Pick up a book of common prayer. Keep a prayer list and notepad by your prayer spot. Actually pray through that list. Every Sunday we give you a great prayer list, don't we? Add your prayers to that for your loved ones, for those that are on your heart. Pray for yourself. Be intentional. It's pretty easy to burn up 15 minutes when you do that. And then once that becomes a pattern in your life, between now and Easter, all of a sudden, if you miss a day, you're going to go, something's wrong. What's the matter? And you're going to realize, I didn't pray. You're going to crave that. You're going to pretty soon find yourself saying, I love prayer. I love prayer. God calls us to be in conversation with him, to listen to him, to hear him. Are you ready to answer that call? To deepen your life of prayer with him? Let's begin right now. Lord Jesus, I give thanks for the gift of prayer. Lord, we sometimes struggle to make prayer a priority. We sometimes struggle to take the time to really spend with you, and yet we'll so willingly spend hours on the phone or over coffee with our best friends. Lord, help us to have a passion to be in conversation with you, to hear your voice, to be in your presence. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.